This is Q on CBC Radio 1 from PRI, Public Radio International, and on Bold Television. Well, it was nearly 40 years ago, right here on CBC Radio, the great Peter Zosky asked our listeners to complete the phrase, as Canadian as... dot dot dot. The winning entry, as Canadian as possible under the circumstances, still gets a smile today. And maybe it still rings true that the Canadian national identity can be a restrained, even elusive concept. But according to Ken Dryden, that's changing, or at least it should be. The legendary Montreal Canadiens goalie turned lawyer, businessman, and now Liberal Member of Parliament is urging Canadians to tell a different story about ourselves, and not just for the sake of hearing something new, but for the sake of Canada's present and future in a globalized world. His new book is titled Becoming Canada, and Ken Dryden joins me now live in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Hello, how are you? Thank you for doing this. I, I understand this is the first interview you've done on this book, and yes, it is. We're, uh, we're honored that you would come and do this. Thank you. Uh, and you know, there's so much I want to ask you about this book, so I'm going to ask you to be somewhat economical in your answers, because okay. there's a lot to get to here. <laughs> the book is a call for Canadians to undergo a national reconsideration, you say, to change, as you say, our common story. Why? What's wrong with the way we consider ourselves mm-hmm. today? Because I think we're, we're a lot more than we say we are. I mean, that, that, that phrase that I have heard all my life of typically Canadian, A, uh, explaining uh, why things don't turn out at certain moments and how things always seem to not quite fulfill themselves, I don't think that's true. I'm, I'm not sure it's ever been true, but I don't think it's true at all now. And uh, uh, and we just need to look at the people who are doing so fantastically well. And whether it is in the in in the arts and music, uh, writers, business people, scientists. Uh, they don't believe that. They don't believe it for a minute. That hasn't been their life experience. That hasn't been close to their life experience. And yet, if, if that's how one understands oneself, that's what you end up becoming. We know that in our own lives at home with family expectations. We know that that's the case in businesses. We know it's the case with teams. You know, you, you end up becoming what you think you are. And we have been thinking we have been much less than what we really are. Interesting when you say when it comes to teams, because to illustrate your point, you look at a couple of important national institutions, namely the team you played for in the 70s, the Montreal Canadiens, and then the team that you were the president of in the 90s, the Toronto Maple Leafs. How did those teams, two teams and their stories, illustrate your message and the difference in when it comes to believing or not believing? Yeah. We had, I mean, in, in Montreal in the 1970s, we had the right understanding of ourselves. I mean, we knew we were an important team. There were six teams in the NHL. Uh, by that time, there were more than that. But, you know, and, and, and only a couple of teams from Canada. And, and, the, and, and, and Montreal had, you know, the best arena, fans that were unbelievably um, uh, of, a, of a mind uh, where, where hockey was important to them and created an atmosphere where it felt important. Um, we knew that what we were doing mattered. And what followed out of that was, was an owner that didn't dare uh, not to reflect that kind of understanding, uh, a manager that was the best and knew he had to deliver the best, a coach that was the best that knew he had to deliver the best, and players who had no right not to be uh, the best because we were the best players. And, and that was our, you know, in, in, in sports, you call it, you know, tradition. We don't talk about it as our story, as our, our set of understandings. You're saying that legacy, that story actually fueled what oh, you guys absolutely. did on the ice. It, I mean, you, you don't arrive in Montreal as, as born winners. I mean, you, you, you arrive into a set of understandings. And, and we had no right but to be special. Um, and, and one of the problems in Toronto, you know, was that it, it was that that was the Toronto understanding for years and years as well. And then Toronto got out of that habit and, and of where the message from ownership and whether it was just glibly and defensively saying, well, it doesn't matter whether we win, I can still, you know, go to the bank. Whether, whether it was serious or wasn't serious, it delivered a kind of message that meant that they didn't have to be as good as was in them to be. But when you say typically, typically, typically Canadian A or we're just Canada, it uh, doesn't work anymore. I mean, one way to look at that is to say it's self-defeating or it's in, uh, part of our uh, much discussed over the decades inferiority complex. Another way at, at looking at it is to say we're humble, we're yeah. modest. Yeah. What's wrong with that? And, and in fact, the thing that's 
terrific about it, and I try to go into it in, in the book, is that, is, is that in, a, in a world of empires and of, uh, and, and of where the, the most powerful countries economically and militarily dominate the landscape and, 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 and run the dynamics, yeah, it, it makes uh, you know, those that are small and humble, makes them kind of irrelevant. But in a global world, where in fact there really, it isn't possible, and all you need to do is look at the U.S. and try to impose itself on the world as it has traditionally. When you really live in a global world, there's no country that really is the big guy that can, that can really impose. And, and the kind of attitude that, that works in a truly global world is one that is humble. It is one of, of, of listeners, of people who work with each other, who compromise, who find ways of getting along, who are patient. I mean, our history, which seemed to lead us into, uh, into irrelevance in a global world, makes us absolutely essential. So, so, uh, we, have to, so we should be humble, because that's a quality that you like about us, but we should also believe we're going to win. Absolutely. I mean, that's what, you know, p- people who... Um, were the people, Canadians humble? Well, yes. I mean, you, you, you know. I mean, when, the Montreal Canadiens. That's right. I mean, when, when you, in order to win, you've got to fear that you're going to lose. I mean, you, you know that at the next moment, you know, something might happen. And, and you have to fear that possibility and be respectful of, of, of that possibility. I mean, look at, I mean, one of the examples, and I don't use many sports examples in the book, but at the end, I talk about the, the Olympics in, in Vancouver. And, and, uh, and all along, there was that debate, you know, especially when we weren't doing very well in the first week or so of the Olympics, of own the podium. What an awful phrase. I mean, we're, we're overreaching. We're, we're uh, you know, that's not us. Uh, and, and look what happens. We just embarrass ourselves. Um, the athletes, they weren't embarrassed. They weren't, they weren't even thinking about that. Their own experience right. in their sports in the world had been... We know how good we are. We know we can win. We are completely unimpressed with this soul-searching debate over whether own the podium is the right phrase or not. We're good. We know we're good. And in the end, they demonstrate. You know, I was going to get to that later in this interview, but why not take it on right now? When you you do, and your epilogue is about the the own the podium and and, uh, and how we should embrace that. Where is the line, though, Ken, between... Uh, believing in ourselves, embracing that, go for gold, etc., and descending into some kind of we're number one dogma uh, that that becomes myopic, right. that is reminiscent of some of our neighbors right. that that right. we don't necessarily want right. to become. Look, look at those those athletes in Vancouver, and just just remember them. You know, close your eyes, think back, think back of what they looked like, what they sounded like. They weren't strutters. I mean, Sidney Crosby, is he a strutter? I mean, is he the, 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 the kind of guy that, you know, is there pumping his fist, we're number one, we're the greatest, all the rest of it? No chance. Not at all. I mean, you don't have to be a strutter to be a winner. I mean, those, those people, I mean, think of the, those people who are the best at what they do uh, now who are Canadian, whether it's Guy La Liberté, uh, you know, some of our musicians, uh, our writers, you know, Atwood or, or Alice Munro. I mean, are they people who just run out in front of the camera all the time, draw attention to themselves and say how fabulous I am? No, no but, uh, not and, at and, all. Which, uh, you're absolutely right. But at the same time, I'm not sure that Margaret Atwood is out there saying, I'm going to own the podium either. I, I think that, I think that, that, that well, maybe Margaret Maybe she says it differently. At, I was going to say, <laughs> I, I think Margaret Atwood knows exactly how good she is. And, and, and she knows it so well that, in fact, the next time, you know, the next day she sits down at her computer those words better be as good as she knows she is and needs to be in her head. Uh, but there's a difference between um, believing in what we do and needing the gold medal, isn't there? Uh, maybe, but, I, but, but, but the point again I mean, Do we is, need the reward? Is well, well, I think, I mean, I think what I'm trying to get at in this book is that, is, is that if you do have that typically Canadian A version of ourselves in, in, in our heads, then, in fact, you know, we, we, and, and, and with that only self-deprecating humor, we end up cutting ourselves off at the knees. You know, we are, are different now. We are better than that now. And we also represent in Canada something that really is a global experiment. 
I mean, we talk about that at times, but it's absolutely true. I mean, we are not just a multicultural place. Uh, uh, the U.S. is multicultural. The U.K. is multicultural. So is France and so is Germany. But in fact, the nature of the, uh, the relationship that we have between those different multicultures, you know, in, in this country is a very different one. We get along here better than in all of those other places. Let me come to that, uh, come back to that. Uh, let, let me actually get to the precipitant for why you say you've, you've written this book now, why we need this redefinition, this reconsideration. Um, you talk about there being a, a malaise. You talk about there being a disengagement, partly based on the politics uh, of this country and in this country. Um, and uh, you, you chronicle the last few years. Uh, uh, there is a theme that comes up again and again. You say that politics gets in the way of important stories. Uh, and, and you talk about Obama and Obama uh, having Americans believing in the idea of the story of America. Uh, but then the story gets smothered in politics once he's in office, for example. If politics ruins everything, why are you still in politics? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think politics has to ruin everything and politics is not irrelevant. I, I tried to write this book without writing about politics. This book started as a speech that I gave at a number of different universities in which I insisted at the beginning that there would not be one mention about any political party, any party leader, any prime minister, past or present, because I knew that most of the audience wasn't interested in politics and I would lose most of the audience as soon as I mentioned politics. And then I realized that, that just because politics is an obstacle doesn't make it irrelevant. Politics is very relevant to this discussion about what it is we really are as a country. An awful lot of how we end up d expressing ourselves as a country, at least in a public way, comes through politics and, and, and through the political media. And if the political media only writes about politics as if politics is just last night's game, then we're not going to get very far. And so the whole idea was, was to try to get beyond that because Politics, whether we like it or not, is part of this story. You don't go easy on our Prime Minister, Stephen Harper. I don't think that'll surprise anybody. But, but you, you, you really depict him as this anti-liberal, uh, small a liberal, although also large <laughs> liberal, anti-liberal Machiavellian politician, uh, really obsessed with and interested in power and hating the Liberal Party. But you also blame the Liberal Party for, mm -hmm. for losing its way. You talk about those years leading up to the last couple of years uh, where uh, the obsession with power trumps the story, where um, uh, forgetting the Canadian story in, in the infighting within the Liberal Party over, mm -hmm. over power. You've been part of that party. Mm -hmm. You were there. Do you take responsibility for the Liberal Party losing, losing its way? Part of it. I mean, that, 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 and, and I, don't, I don't think that the, 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 this book and those parts are written as if blaming. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just trying to express what my uh, observations have been in those couple of years. Again, in the context of the story about Canada. This is a book about Canada. This is not a book about Stephen Harper or Michael Ignatieff, the Liberals, the Conservatives, or it is, it is only offering those parts as a way of providing a context for the challenge of how we go about helping ourselves understand this country But you know when you're a large liberal, when you're a member of parliament, uh, um, everything will be seen Absolutely. through partisan glasses, right? right? That's right. I mean, do, 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 does part of you can think maybe you'd be more effective in, in, in speaking around a, about, about a story like this if you weren't a sitting member of parliament? No, I, I, I mean, I've thought about that, but I don't think so. And I mean, and it's why, it, I mean, it's, it's why I do interviews uh, like this that are not first off, you know, political, uh, political media interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the blurbs on the book, are not from people who are political media. They are people who have experienced Canada, who have expressed Canada in their work every bit as closely as, as uh, you know, intimately as, as the political media, but they have a different take. You know, to them, it is not all about what happened yesterday on Parliament Hill. It is not all about question period. That's not what politics really is and, and needs to be if, in fact, we are going to live up to what's, what's in us. You are very inspired by Barack Obama. 
that's what I get from this book. I mean, you, uh, you, you speak of him, I, I dare say, quite lovingly at times, and, and, and about his reach when he was campaigning, at least, to that's become right. president, his, his attempt to go beyond the politics of the day and to speak about a bigger America. And you, and, and you say that George W. Bush created the conditions for an Obama to, to rise. Uh, do, you, do you think Stephen Harper, in as much as you depict him as the anti-Obama, is creating the conditions for an Obama in Canada? And if so, where is he? Yeah. Possibly. I mean, I, I think I think this, you know, that, that what I tried to do with this book and I think I mean, what what is inside me in terms of of understanding Canada, feeling about Canada, I think is inside the bones of virtually every Canadian. And it's it's it, this is only an opportunity to try to express it. I mean, the problem, I think, with Obama and, and that I went in, tried to go into it is that when he was campaigning, he was talking from the America, you know, that, that, that notion of, you know, the America, not the United States, America, that, that place of, of specialness and, 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 and the rest of it. He was talking from that part of him to that part of, of a citizen and, and essentially saying, look around us. Is this the real America? Isn't the real America this and that and the other? The real America wouldn't do this. The real America would do that. I think what, is, what has happened in, in, in the last while is that he's forgotten that that was really the way in which he connected to people. Mm. Since he's become president, it's all about issues. It's all about health care or, or uh, Afghanistan or Iraq or something without the, the, the preamble that says, this is America. What America would do about health care, the real America, what it would do about Afghanistan or Iraq, the real America, he's forgotten his own preamble, which is really the essence of what his message was and the essence of what people heard during that campaign. And he's sort of now just caught in the mire of where he ends up sounding like everyone else. But who... Uh, do we have anyone in Canada that you that is talking about the real Canada beyond the issues of the day that is cap capturing our story and leading us forward? Because I think for a lot of people listening, it doesn't feel like we do have anybody doing that. That that doesn't that may be the case right now. That doesn't mean that it absolutely isn't in countless people. Um, you know, if you went back three years ago, um, who was talking about America? I mean, that the, the, the Barack Obama did not exist, you know, three years ago. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that I mean, the, the people who are really talking about and, and expressing that kind of Canada, you know, are the, the, the people who are the writers, the musicians, and, and so many people uh, outside of politics in the work in which they are doing, they are absolutely expressing that Canada in everything that they are doing. And now it's time to just realize that it's that we need to go beyond just the subtle expression of that, but to something more distinct and more and, and clearer. You better keep supporting uh, uh, funding to the ar to the arts if you keep using writers and musicians <laughs> no. as your example of, <laughs> of, of the, the Canadian story and future. Well, just look at I mean, just look. You know, you, you I do you know. Talk to them every day. Yes, it's unbelievable. This idea that Canada is a blueprint for the world, this is the crux of, of what you call our new story. The multiculture, not multiculturalism, but right. multiculture. Right. Explain that. Well, I think that, that you know, I, I think, as I said before, the U.S., U.K., and other countries, they're multicultural. Uh, I think the difference in Canada is that, is that those new people that came to the U.S. and to the U.K., France, and others really came into a place that was very well developed, very well established in terms of its understandings of itself. I mean, it, you know, France is as it is. The U.S., for the most part, is as it is. The impact of those new immigrants is relatively small. The impact of America or France on them is very large. I think Canada, with, with a less uh, um, uh, less concrete, less established, less visible sense of ourselves has been affected significantly by those new immigrants coming to Canada. It isn't just Canada affecting them. We have been affected. 
we've gone, I think, from, from a, something that is a, a, a multicultural place to something that is a real multiculture, where in fact we are creating this culture together. And, 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 uh, and, and that is quite remarkable. Is there a tension between what the old idea of what Canada it was and should be is and this new multiculture? At times, sure there is. Um, but I think for most people, you know, I think most people find it really exciting uh, that, that we are creating, we really are creating something that hasn't existed. And, and we are on the way in that of, of creating something that is really quite interesting and important. Because, you know, as we talked about before, you know, in a truly global world, that's the only way in which a global world can can get along, can make it. My time with you is almost gone. I've got one minute left. Let me end here. You you lament what you call the culture of irony, particularly in liberal left progressive circles. You say, and this resonates for me, my generation. That you know, the the sort of Daily Show, if you will, look at the world, is uh, is something you lament. And you write as as the attitude of an age, it is a disaster. You talk about it as giving up. How do we stop giving up? How do we really get post-ironic? I, I think that, that the irony is funny and irony works as, as, as irony. But as something that is the, the only commentary of a time, it doesn't work. You know, that, that irony really is keeping it something at arm's length, uh, just laughing at it, taking nothing seriously, focusing on nothing, being right all the time. You know, that, that's what irony is. I think how you get beyond it is you, des- is you decide that something else matters. There is something that really is important. That's how I think you, that, that politics changes as well is that if, 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 if politics doesn't have something bigger to focus on, what happens is that those in politics just focus on each other. If there is nothing really big and important at, on that table, forget it, we just focus at each other. I think unless there is a bigger story, a bigger direction, then uh, irony continues and our politics continues. Thank you for being here. Thanks a lot. That is NHL great lawyer, businessman, and liberal member of parliament, Ken Dryden, who's been with me here live in Studio Q. His new book is called Becoming Canada, and it's published by McClellan and Stewart.